I'm calling it. Not your usual keynote address. Okay. No, I'm delighted to be back here in Hamlin, though I expect it has less to do with my writing or speaking abilities than my cafe singing style. But we'll find out more about that later. For now, it's time to turn our attention to your graduation, which, though it begins with the same four letters as gradually, has suddenly uh, been thrust upon you. I'm certain you don't feel the last few weeks have been gradual at all. Now, normally, a graduation speaker is supposed to exhort the masses, make them eager and excited, send even the B students out into the real world uh, in a bubble of A's. Admiration, adulation, ambition, and even absolution. Not today. I am not going to give you the old pro to young pro, straightforward shoulder push into the world of children's books. I'm not going to give you the old soldier new recruit warnings of potholes, bolt holes, and foxholes. I'm not going to give you the mother talk, the grandmother talk, the agent aunt talk about doing your best and working hard and butt in chair and I love you no matter what happens talk. You have a hall full of such relatives to comfort and congratulate you today. And I'm certainly not going to tell you never to quit your day job or your spouse in order to write. You certainly already know that. Still, it's a tough new publishing world out there. So different from the cozy, collegial, literate, grammatical, leisurely, supportive, small town world I entered in the 1960s, which was also, by the way, sexist, racist, ages, bigoted, and classist. And I'm glad to be on the far side of that. However, uh, as I am, alas, barely computer literate, and in fact, the original speech that I wrote for you uh, was lost in a computer disaster. To be writing from scratch for your days before coming here. And as I'm certainly not up for self publishing or giving up my copyrights under the aegis of information should be free, or as one very wise friend uh, has added, but entertainment needs to be paid, you will find I have strong feelings about all those things, but this talk isn't going to be about that either. Besides, you already know more about computers and ebooks and iPads and that sort of development than I do. Your knees and backs are younger and will hold you up better than mine in the churning currents of today's writing world. You understand what OMG and LOL and WTF and WWJD and YMMY mean, and I'm still in the world of SWAC and XXOO. You know SOL and I know SOS. You can multi-read, multitask on the internet, you don't break down in hopeless bathos when the computer fails to work, or kick in the screen with your nine size nine boot. You know how to fix it, most of the time anyway. Not me. I'm the wife, now the widow, of the chairman of the, of the University of Massachusetts Computer Science Department. I came to such machines late, having made do with one reliable typewriter after another since I was 12 years old. So you will understand, I think, when I tell you that a small part of me wants to mutter, get off my lawn, or the writer's equivalent, which is, where has literature and storytelling gone, storytelling gone and who is Suzanne Collins, anyway? <laughs> okay, now you know what I'm not going to tell you. But what am I going to say? Well, I'm taking my text today from six people. Arnold Glasgow, Jim Perlman, Mark Twain, Isaac Bashevis Singer, Emily Dickinson, and Oliver Cromwell. Two humorists, a poet, a storyteller, an editor, and a roundhead. And if you've only heard of two out of the six, so I'm certain you know who Suzanne Collins is, uh, soon you will know all of them. It will make you a better person. Possibly a better writer as well. So, first, Arnold Glasson. He ran a humor magazine for over 60 years, and this is one of my favorite of his own models. The key to everything is patience. You get the chicken by hatching the egg, not by smashing it. These days, with our ability to publish our own poems, stories, novels, books on the internet, or in e-books, we have tossed the egg out of the window entirely. But we've also tossed out other things along with it. Good editing, good cover illustration, broad publicity, a sense of the right places to be reviews, list of all the places to send books do for awards, the business and the busyness of old-fashioned publishing. Years of hard-earned knowledge that created everything from 
where the wild things are to Walter the farting dog, from Harry Potter to the Twinkling Vampire books, from Fahrenheit 451, Wolf Hall, and Ruby Fruit Jungle, to the bridges of Madison County and the Da Vinci Code. Well, I would be the last one to tell you that traditional publishing always gets it right. But we have also tossed out advances from publishers that may be as small as several hundred dollars or as large as several millions in order to make authors pay for their own editors, cover artists, publicity, and tours. And for what? For lack of patience. Because we want our books published instantly. We want to be published no matter whether we deserve it or not. For lack of humility, thinking that every little thing one scrawls must be read by the multitudes. Trust me, I'm as, you know, that's, that's one of my problems. For lack of authority and the old sense of the word in which the word author is invented. For lack of honesty, sometimes you have to look at what you have written and willing to see it truly and say, this is crap. You need to embrace revision, become a revisionary. You must learn bonardi, which is a phrase I recently heard from poet Jane Hirschfield, who said that the painter, Pierre Bonnard, used to sneak into museums or into the houses of those who had purchased his paintings and repaint sections because he never felt the painting was finished. I love that. We all need to practice bonardi. Flaubert's, uh, Flaubert's definition of genius is a long patience. So this serves the writer best. The short patience has another meaning, impatience, the inability to linger on an idea or plumb its depth or make certain that what you think you have put on the page is actually what you have put there. Now, I started this speech right after completing three revisions of a novel under contract for the editor, though by my own calculation, it was actually revision 22 in the process. And I'm still finding infelicities, still finding characters acting, well, out of character. I'm still uh, finding moments in the writing where I thought I was clear and clearly was not. Time on the texture seemed thin as the paper on which it is printed. Those in the editorial business, and I'm sure you've heard this, quote the phrase by Phil Coach that, uh, that authors should murder one's darlings. They don't mean he didn't mean murder one of the cop characters, but murder that overly precious bit of writing where you're showing off too much and giving too little to the reader. Sometimes, without the help of a good editor, a second eye, a beta reader, we writers become so mired in the bog of our own writing that we can't even see it's a bog. We've been there so long it's hard to remember that there's a harder surface along the bog edges. Quite simply, we need some kind of editorial guidance and hand. In going through our manuscripts, we need that long patience, our own and the long patience of a good editor. I remember a time when, as an editor at Harcourt, I was working on a brilliant series of manuscripts I bought by the always wonderful Edina author, Patricia Reedy. It was the first book of what would eventually be called the Enchanted Forest Chronicles. And I sent one page back to her, where I circled 17 places in green ink with a note. Does your husband know about your love affair with the semicolon? <laughs> yes. This was a young adult book with 17 semicolons on a single manuscript page. Now, maybe in the 18th or 19th century, she would have gotten away with that. Or maybe if her name had been Jane Austen or Henry James. But not now. And Pat, such a consummate professional, that mistake never happened again. We still laugh about it, even though the aforementioned husband is long since gone. When I worked on my first graphic novel, Foil, the editor made me go back and back and back again seven times in all, to get the magic right, to deepen the characters, to understand better the visual pacing for a comic. I was waiting for the next go-round, and I came home to hear on my answering machine, Oh, Jane Yolen, oh, Jane Yolen, you are so good, so good. 
And that's how I knew we were done with the revisions. And I kept that voicemail for weeks, playing it whenever I felt downcast, on how my writing and my life was going, until one day my granddaughter, who was living with me at the time, erased it. So if you meet me later, in the hallway, at the, at the dinner, signing books, I hope you take time to say to me, or to your fellow writers, or to your editors for that matter, you were so good. So good. Now, I have to warn you that the editorial process, while it sometimes feels very adversarial, is actually a different A word. It's advisable. Revision means simply re again and vision to see, to dream. So revision is that time for the writer to see again and dream again, to get herself out of the bog and onto the good virtues. All it takes is the patience to do it, because the process cannot be rushed. Now the second quote is from Jim Perlman, an editor of the literary press, Holy Cow, in Duluth. And he wrote to me once, urging onwardly, onwardly. Now first you have to know that Jim is an inveterate monster as well as a poet himself and an editor of poets. He knows when to push onwardly and when to caution onwardly. But we writers need to be able to do much of that ourselves. And that means being honest. It means getting into a writing room or finding a beta reader who is not just going to give us the onward, onwardly part, but the onwardly part as well. When my children were little, they are all published writers now. They would each come to me at one time or another with a piece of writing to ask what I thought of it. And I would always answer, do you want the mommy response or the editor response? And being good little kids, they said, editor response. But I actually knew better. You know, you've probably found this out yourselves. New writers have tender skins, easily punctured, hard to sew back up again. Scar easily. <laughs> Remember those newly hatched chickens in the Glasgow section of this speech? That's the young or new writer, pin feathers barely fluffed out. So I would say to each questioning child, mommy responds first. This is wonderful. And once they knew that, they could actually hear the rest of it instead of listening to a scream of self pity. But this section needs you to check your dictionary for spelling, and this paragraph is too wordy, very darling style. I don't think this sentence means what you think it means, and so on. But in the end, after the critique was done, I would repeat that basically, this piece is wonderful. Now, I'm in a weekly critique group, as some of you know, and we are always careful to say what we like about a piece before offering criticism. It shows we care, we are listening, we want to be constructive. We aren't adversarial, but advisable. And we are all professionals. I'm reminded of a British reality show that I watched when I in Scotland. It's called Homes Under the Hammer, which follows different folk who buy rented out properties at auction and then fix them up to sell or rent them out or occasionally live in themselves. And after the refurbs are at least partway through, the realtors are invited in and they say things like, if the refurbishment continues to a thought standard, we could sell it for, and that's what an editor is telling you. You hear the selling part, but the editor is emphasizing refer to a fine standard, which is the part you should be listening to. So sharpen your onwardly word here. Listen to what someone tells you. There's a problem. They may not know how to solve it. In fact, they probably won't know, because solving it is your, in solving the problem in your book, is your problem, not theirs. And now, onwardly to number three. Mark Twain, he wrote, of course truth is stranger than fiction. Fiction has to make sense. Well, even poetry has to make sense, so it's a kind of bend your mind around this metaphor kind of sense. But we have to remember that just because something is actual doesn't make it true with a capital T. So I want to tell you a story, something that actually happened to me. My husband, David Stemple, now I need you to remember that, David Stemple, and I came back from a nine months journey in a VW camper bus around Britain, the continent, Greece, and the Middle East. 
um, where I had become pregnant with our first child in Paris's Bois de Boulogne. It was the 60s, after all. We, brought a, we bought an eight-room house in Conway, Massachusetts, and two weeks later had a baby. All the furniture in the world that we owned was a brass bed, a roll-top desk, a, best, a guest bed where my mother stayed for a week, plus a room full of baby furniture. And so we spent our weekends. Uh, and once I was fully ambulatory, I spent weekdays as well, going to homestead auctions, trying to furnish eight rooms on the cheap and the quick. David was working at the University of Massachusetts, so on my own with the baby, I went to an auction at the homestead of an old man who had recently died. Because of the baby's schedule, I'd gotten there too late for the previews, and with Heidi and her baby carriage, we were in the back of the crowd. All I had to go on when the bidding began was on gut instinct, because I hadn't gotten close enough to look at stuff. So when I, the items were held up, I sort of squinted and made a quick decision. And in this way, I bought a dresser for $7. Now, when we returned home and I got the baby to sleep and I wrestled the dresser out of the van, I realized it was a truly ugly piece of furniture. And far too heavy for me to cart it into the house and upstairs by myself, so I left it in the driveway. But I looked through the drawers and find, found out that they were full of the dead man's underwear. But beneath the worn boxer shorts, I found a small cast iron bag. But it was locked. I couldn't open it, but I rattled it, and I could hear paper, and I could hear um, coins. So I thought, well, maybe I hadn't entirely wasted the seven dollars. When David got home, he took a hammer and chisel and forced open the bank. And inside were fifteen dollars and one dollar bills and a couple of rare early American coins. Score. Plus, there was an article, a newspaper article about the old man's father who'd been in the theater when the night that Lincoln was shot, which I thought was fascinating. And for some reason, I turned over the article, and on the back was an obituary for somebody named Stemple. OK, that was a little spooky. David was a Stemple. The man in the article was a Stemple. It's not a common name in uh, New England. In fact, spelled our way, it, we were the only ones in Western Mass. The greatest concentration of samples is in West Virginia, where my husband was from. So, how cool was that? An obituary for the sample on the back of an old newspaper in the bottom of an old dresser I bought on a whim at a Homestead auction. Now, that's the actual story. But where is the truth in it? Where's the sense? Where's the characterization? Where's the art? Um, it may give you a momentary free song. I'll grant you it's a little bit scary in a small world sort of way. No. But what else? Nothing. It's not fiction. Mark Twain had it right. Fiction, the truth is stranger than fiction. Fiction has to make sense. As a story, my anecdote makes no sense. Has no meaning, is a little bit spooky, and nothing else. But as an anecdote, to be told at a table with a lot of wine, it's fun. <laughs> so I need you to listen to Mark Twain. A poem, a story, a novel is crafted, not just told. The characters may be based on people you know, but there has to be invention and story, metaphor at the ground level. As writers, we must not just go after truth with a small t, but truth with a capital letter. And if you have to lie, tell a story to get there, then that's what you do. Number four is Isaac Bashev, a singer who was a great Jewish storyteller, whom I have dubbed the Hans Jewish Anderson of America. He came to Smith College, my alma mater, some years after I graduated. And since we now live uh, not far from the campus, I went to hear him speak. He was a charming, folksy, storytelling kind of speaker. And in the course of the talk, he said this, truth in art that is boring is not true. And it was as if he shoved a hot poker into my brain because I thought that is the most important thing I have heard about writing in years. Simply put, if what you write is boring, no one will listen to it, so it won't be true. You have to make your story intrinsically interesting, not bluntly and baldly set out your truth in 18 point Gothic gold letters. No one wants to be lectured by a novel or poem. We want to be entertained 
moved, taken to a new place, watched characters have interactions and adventures, and when we close the book, those characters will live on inside of us, and then we will know their truths. So thank you, Mr. Singer. Put another way, and this is number five, Emily Dickinson, who is my neighbor in Massachusetts, two towns away, wrote, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. And I love the sly use of the word lies there, because we storytellers, we consummate liars, do have to tell the ultimate truth in our stories. Otherwise, what is the point of writing? But always tell that truth on the slant. If I ever learn needlework in my next incarnation, those two things, truth and art that is boring is not true, and tell all the truth but tell it slant, will be my first and last attempts at a sampler. Six, I'm going to remind you who Oliver Cromwell was. English soldier, leader of the Roundheads, who became Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland, after leading the Protestant Puritans against the Cavaliers, those upper classes, most of whom were Catholics. He was part of the crew that beheaded King Charles I. And this is what he famously said. He exhorted his troops to work hard, trust in God, keep your balance open. <laughs> I've always told my students that the only, um, oh, I'm sorry, I suppose I could change this for writers by saying, work hard, trust in luck, and keep your balance open. <laughs> I've always told my students that the only magic word I have for writing is pick. The yeah, IC button chair. Without sitting down every day and writing something, there is no point in believing you were a writer. Work hard. That's it. Truly. The rest, God or luck, clean vowels or clean vowels, will follow as they will. None of it helps if you haven't done the hard work of writing. And you have to make the hard work look, smell, seem easy. My husband, along with being a computer scientist, was an avid bird watcher. In that community, he was known as a lucky birder, meaning he constantly and consistently found the rare birds, or the new to Massachusetts birds, or the never before discovered mating birds in the Connecticut Valley. And whenever he heard someone calling that, he would always shake his head, and he would answer this, I show up. He meant that luck follows and favors the people who show up, that a birder who put in the hours in the field, that any birder who put in the hours in the field had as much of a chance of seeing the good stuff uh, as he did, certainly much more than the birder who only went outside once a month at best. Or as scientist Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared. Writing is also about showing up, getting to your desk, doing the hard graft, day after day after day. Nobody likes to hear that. Nobody. But it's a simple fact. You need to write, not just long to have written. And if you write, and write, and write some more, you will keep getting better, and luck will find you, because you showed up. Trust me. Would I lie? <laughs> well, actually, yes. I lie. I lie in stories. And I lie with stories, but when I give a speech, especially a graduation speech, I give you the unvarnished and often unwanted truth. So that's what I came to tell you. And to cap it here are four poems I've written about the writing process that I've offered you. Here's the first one. Artistic statement number one. Do not be fooled. Never be fooled by the brackets between my eyebrows or the neat little lines in my poem. Do not think me content in the sheepfold. Do not judge me by the lithographic map. Do not assume me assuming the posture, the rigid, rigid spine, the snap of salute. I turn the map upside down to read it. Leap the folds fence. Write the last lines first. A cauldron simmers inside me. A caldera, a chaos, a concatenation, a stew of my own intestines. I feed on my own heart. A word done containing both heat and art. My stomach roils bulges, crawls, then my womb opens to the universe, and I give birth to a dancing star. Here's the second one. It's called The Muse Complains. So I says to her, 
My turn. You got to listen, not just keep talking. Otherwise, nothing's going to fill that empty space of yours. Art doesn't. Art don't just make itself up, you know. It takes quiet, and you so fill with the day's noise you don't hear. Close the door. Put down the phone. Click the mute. I gotta get a word in edgewise. I tells her. But she keeps yakking about her day, her crappy life, her loneliness. The kids don't call, don't write what she needs from the grocery, uh, what the New York Epic Times says. But listen to me, not so much. We got work here, I shout. The two of us, that old team, me, you, a long history between. I got food to buy too, and ambrosia for places to go. I haven't been to Athens in years. And do for new spring hat, berets are oh, so last century, so my cards tell me. But I'm here, doing what I gotta do. When you gonna listen? And then there's this one called Standing on Shoulders, and it has as an epigram, Art stands on the shoulders of craft and passion. So here I stand, my toes dug deep into the shoulders of the giant. I feel his muscles bunch beneath me, not trying to throw me off, just a small testing shrug. I do not fall, but it is a close thing. The wind is thin this high up. I can see the patchwork of landscapes spread out before me, a wedding quilt of colors I cannot name. Do not try this if you are afraid of falling. Do not begin this if you are not ready to be stretched, to be tested, to start again. Art begins up here, but ends down there, patched into the world that is both real and imagined and whole. And finally, resolved, combustion. First, find the right tinder, a handful of dry grass, the idea of the poem piecemeal, shaggy, rough, flaking in the hand. A bit of flint next, the hard idea of needing something striking at the core. Find a stick not for poking about with. That will come later in the revision, but a place to cradle the nascent flame. Then blow. Oh, wait. Your hot air is not regulated enough. You might put the small spark out with too quick, too percussive a blow. Thrust the ember into the pith, into the heart of the poem. Feel the heat of it browning the edges, curling, curing, curating your lines. Now you are ready. The fire is set. Breathe deep, steady, passionately slow. Blow yourself apart. So, my new friends, new graduates, here's the torch passed from me to you. Make a lovely blaze. <laughs>